<laughs> I think that's the third round of applause we've gotten. So, <laughs> hello everyone and welcome to tonight's edition of Mac and Chat. I think some of you have already seen me and probably heard three rounds of applause. That's more than I've gotten in the last nine months or ten <laughs> months during quarantine. I am pleased as punch uh, about tonight's episode. We have a very special guest with us. There is a lady that I was blessed to meet only briefly once in my life. Uh, I've adored her since I was a little boy. She was a star of stage, screen, and television, and one of the most underrated actresses, performers, all-around performers that we ever had. Of course, I'm talking about the late, great Miss Kay Ballard. And tonight, her co-author and friend, Jim Hasselman, is going to be joining us to discuss her life and career. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mac and Chat. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope everyone is staying safe and warm. It's a little nippy out there. At least it is here on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. But um, also want to uh, a little shout out to some of my friends out there who I know have just started getting their their vaccination for COVID-19. So we love you and we're praying for you and it's a step in the right direction. Also, a little birthday shout out. I believe today is Sandy Duncan's birthday, uh, her 75th, as well as Tyne Daly's 75th birthday. Two, two uh, other wonderful performers that we also love and adore. So happy birthday, Sandy, and happy birthday, Tyne Daly. Now, there, as I mentioned in the, in the preamble, there is a lady who I, I remember her the first time I ever saw this lady, and I, hopefully her friend will correct me if I'm wrong here, she did a bunch of uh, Francesco Rinaldi commercials in the 80s. <laughs> that was, I think, my introduction to her. But you saw her on Alice. You saw her on The Muppet Show. She was the star of The Mothers-in-Law along with Eve Arden. She literally did it all. And that is Miss Kay Ballard. She wrote a wonderful memoir, the title of which alone is just worth the price, How I Lost 10 Pounds in 53 Years. <laughs> and her co-author, Mr. Jim Hesselman, is joining us tonight so we can reminisce and recollect about the great Kay Ballard. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Jim. Well, thank you for having me. And I have to say that Kay would have loved that jazzy Judy Overture intro. That it's it, it, one of the things I loved when I read the book um, is when she talked about, and this is also in the documentary, there's a wonderful documentary out there called The Show Goes On, and about Kay's life, in which she totally deserves. More people need to know about her. But uh, Judy would go to see her, and and she knew that Kay did a, a tribute to her, and she would sit ringside and say, do me, do me, do me. And Kay would, would oblige and, and do this wonderful homage, uh, conjuring up Judy's essence over the mic right yeah well when you think about i mean one of the first things that when we first started talking about the book and and all of the people that she knew and worked with uh, i said before the history of 20th century showbiz but here's a, a girl from cleveland i was going to say little girl but Kay would have there would have been lightning come down she would say i was never little so, um, <laughs> But here's this girl from the Midwest who is ushering and, and uh, sees the Wizard of Oz and just 
falls in love with all of this uh, glamour in the movie and all of those people. And then she ends up working with Ray Bolger, working with Burt Lahr, knowing Judy Garland. Who does that? Who, who can dream that at 12 years old in Cleveland and then actually have it come true? 12 years old in Elmont, Long Island, and I knew that was never going to happen. <laughs> I had the same, same aspiration. Now, it's Catherine Gloria Bellata is, is her real full name. Yes, and she was in the last few years of her life. She was, uh, in fact, with the, with the book, I believe. She always said she was born in 1926, and she she was actually born in 1925, and she took that year back. <laughs> she, she she never understood why she thought, you know. She said, "Well, why didn't I take three to five years off? They just told me I should take a year off." I I was watching her, and she said, "You know, I'll watch TCM and see all these people that I worked with." And they're all saying they're 10 years younger than me, and I lied for one year. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, or I, I just loved her attitude that she she said, I feel 35 inside. Obviously, you know, I'm not, but it's only when I look at TCM and American movie classics that I go, gee, I really am old. These, these people I worked with have been dead 40, 50 years. Yeah, she, she loved... Uh, watching the news and i think that says a lot about kate she wanted to be current when she was still writing jokes down um material for whenever she could perform it she did her last three concerts and her farewell concert you know bringing up some old things but she was always wondering what was next she always and i think that's you know i think that's why she made it so long um, not only did she work in all those mediums and work so hard for 60 some years and like like I said before we came on the air that she never made a penny. She was so proud that she never made a penny in anything but show business. Yeah. And she, uh, she, I think keeping going was the most important thing to her, whether it was the book and then the tape of the book and then the documentary that she was still working on when she passed. Um, I truly think that that kept her alive. And it's funny when you talk about her being current in her act and, and the jokes and that, but I, what I love is that she, she said she, she wasn't fond of mean spirited comedy. She, that, that kind of turned her off people making fun of, of, of other people. That wasn't her bag. And she, she was not keen on that. Especially in a personal way. I mean, her hero was Henny Youngman and people kind of poo-pooed that, I think. But, but he had such a rapid fire kind of, he would talk about husbands and wives, he would talk about relationships. And it was uh, never really, it was ne never raunchy. And I, I think Kay would cross, uh, push the line a little bit, but it wasn't about personality. She never uh, brought somebody down. She how was always now, about connecting people. How did, first of all, for those of you who haven't read it, you need to, we have both copies, we have, we have paperback, wait a minute. I gotta make sure I'm in the camera here. <laughs> the paperback and the hardcover edition. And um, if you have not read it, How I Lost 10 Pounds in 53 Years, you must. First of all, um, she did an audio recording, but the book itself, you, you feel as though she's in the room talking to you, that you're just sitting over coffee. She, it's just this lovely conversational way I, I also seem to remember her saying in the book that, you know, don't expect chronological from me because I don't remember that way. <laughs> well, and I may have, uh, I, I, how it came about, we were doing the 20th anniversary of Nonsense tour and um, uh, Darlene Love was on the tour as well. And she had just come out with, uh, she gave everybody for Christmas a copy of her memoir. And... Kay, not to be outdone, says, I've been working on a memoir for years and years. And uh, uh, so she showed me some of it. And um, let's say it wasn't um, in order. Okay. It wasn't. Uh, and, and so she really wanted me to know what I thought. And I said, well, if you really want me to know, and, and um, I, I had the audacity to stay up one night and take her little couple pages on Lucy and Desi and not that I grew up in quite in that era, but that was what I knew about. And so I sort of filled it out and I, I turned this over here and I did this and I put it under her door. She called me about 4.30 in the morning. She said, this is brilliant. And so, <laughs> so then we worked for the next year and a half on tour and then, and then after we got done on how we would do this. And that's where interludes came up because Kay is, was brilliant 
but she had the, you know, sometimes she had the attention span of a goldfish. So <laughs> you really couldn't sit down and work for hours and hours. She would get bored and especially about herself. Uh, she loved talking about the people she knew and she loved the idea that people, it was, she was adamant that the people were going to remember Maurice Chevalier and remember Judy Garland and remember all of these people um, because she really felt it was important. And so some of the stories weren't long, but they were the important part of what she was putting down. And yeah. so uh, that's why it's sort of sandwiched in a coffee table book that you can pick up and put down and pick up and put down and not lose the thread, you know. And she did mention, this was again in reference to an interview I had been watching that she was trying to shop it around, but then she, I guess, was a little put off because she said they, the publishers want, you know, they, they want sex and they want tabloid. And, and, and she used a catchphrase that one of my favorite catchphrases, which is that to me is four snores, <laughs> which, which I thought was very commendable uh, of her that she almost seemed put off at one point about writing the book because of what the publishers were saying. No, you got to give us more grit. Right. And, you know, um, when she published that, when, when she was trying to market and publicize it, once it got published, um, there was a section in there about Marlon Brando and everybody, you know, it, it intimated that she had slept with Marlon Brando. And, and that was what everybody wanted to talk about. And she wasn't really happy about that. You know, I mean, that's about as far as the book ever went into that kind of personal knowledge. But, you know, there were a lot of personal things in terms of uh, growing up in an Italian family when she did with two sisters and an older brother yeah. and a, a father who was a cement layer that she was very proud of. She was so proud of her heritage at the same time. And she says in the beginning, you know, it was like Jewish or Italian. It was growing up in the same family about food and guilt. And, and uh, uh, so, so growing up Catholic and all of these things. And she would joke, she would say, Nana, the most important person in her life, her grandmother, that she would say, you, you know, show your legs, right? And she would, she would use that as an excuse. But you, even though they, it wasn't... Uh, controversial. I think you learned a lot about Kay and a lot about human nature that you people could relate to because she was a Midwestern girl from Cleveland. At the end of the day, she was a fan of all of these people and she never grew out of that. And I think if you had said, uh, you know, she wasn't great at taking compliments. She wanted them. Don't, don't get me wrong, but she wasn't great at taking them. She was good at giving them. And, uh, she felt, I think, in her life that she never made it. That was very important to her that young people made it, yeah. that, that she saw that, you know, give them any break you can because they have to make it. And I asked her one time, what is making it, Kay? I said, if you had two Oscars and four Tonys and all of the, you know, because she was not happy that she was never nominated for a Tony. Yeah. Um, and we sort of discussed that had she had all of those things and a couple million dollars and all of these things, um, would that have been making it? And she's not sure. She wasn't sure because she never grew out of the little girl from Cleveland. And so it was sort of this deep hole of you, you couldn't fill all that in. She couldn't realize that. She couldn't play the star. She would never do that. And, and so... It was sort of unfortunate because she kept going after that elusive thing, but I don't think it was really something that she wanted. And it's it's interesting. Uh, I think it was Angela Lansbury who was has been asked the question many times about you know not winning the Academy Award. I mean, she got the honorary Oscar, but not for one of her performances. And and she, you know she said. Sometimes I feel that it's almost a deterrent in a way that it kind of puts a governor on somebody's career, especially if they win it for a particular role. It, you know, it's good in one way, but it can also deter your career on, on the other hand, too. So well, I wonder you, if Kay kind of... stories about it being a curse in that that was the zenith of, of their career and they were 26 and, uh, you know, how can... Nowhere to go but down. <laughs> yeah, they can't compete with themselves, but... I think for her, it was more about the, you know, something like the Tony, uh, the community, the nomination, the acceptance into a community. Yeah. And uh, I think that probably was more important to her than the actual award. Yeah. 
It's yeah, it's interesting you say that. You want the acceptance, and I think it's also wanting to be recognized. I think it's just wanting to to have you know, say, so yeah, you know, you, you you did a good job, and we recognize it. I think that's yeah, totally. Um, well, and she didn't. I don't think she um, like the the tears, which, um, and I can't remember if uh, we said this right before the show, and that was as talented as she was, which when people see the documentary, they will see examples of how talented, even if they've never seen her before, they will say, how have I not, how has she, was she not a superstar? Because of the voice she had, because of the comic timing she had and the comedy she had, she wrote a lot of her own material yeah. and the personality she brought and the poise. And she, as a single woman, worked in nightclubs, worked in television, as you said on the intro, did movies and Broadway and would go back and forth between the two. And I said, even when I was growing up, I remember movie stars would not do television. Exactly. Uh, stage, uh, they wouldn't, television people wouldn't do stage. You know, there was a separation. And so that she kept going in between all of, all of these puns, I don't think that that was, uh, at the time, she didn't get a pat on the back for it for in the in the industry you know you had to be you had to fit in this square or this circle or wherever it was you had to fit and be the best you could there um people like carol burnett and, and uh, like we mentioned martha ray uh, i think they sort of broke that barrier a bit totally that that was a huge struggle and i don't know that that would have happened today yeah and and, and it was tough at home because her parents obviously loved her but Mom was not so thrilled and 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 not ter totally encouraging of what she wanted to do. I mean, I think she said, and she, I think she said this in the book as well. Um, they just didn't understand her. They didn't know that. Uh, they thought, who is this person? She had dark circles <laughs> under her eyes from the time she was born. She looked like she was uh, thirty when she was. 17 it got her work she could go out and work in a nightclub and be underage uh she worked at a record store when i think she was 12. um and i think that she was the oldest daughter they had a son first she had an older brother and very traditional italian catholic family right hard working and relate <laughs> so then along comes Kay, and they didn't know what to think of it she'd say bye mom see you later they wouldn't worry about her. She'd come back. And then she had two sisters younger who did become the wife and had kids and cooked Italian food every day of their life. And uh, she knew that life. But Kay somehow was born very different from the rest of her family. And she knew she was a fish out of water. She had to go. She went off to Chin's Chinese and started in show business. She didn't know what it was. But I think her parents didn't worry about her. And I think the relationship with uh, her father basically said, you know, go, I, I love you. You have to live your life. The mother, her mother probably had a little bit of uh, worry about it, but uh, disappointment in that you weren't going to be like your sisters. But also Kay had said at one point that uh, her mother was very funny. And uh, there was a little bit of sort of competition if boys would come home um, from high school and, and, the, and her mother would sit with them and, and make them laugh and flirt. And uh, so I think there was a little bit of competition that way in her mother that, that possibly, without knowing it, her mother could have performed as well. It's, it's interesting. Debbie Reynolds said something similar about her mother, that she almost felt there was a little bit of jealousy there, that uh, is if she wanted to be doing what Debbie was doing. Um, well, it comes from somewhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I love the stories about, you know, Nana, especially the, uh, on the is it the um, Mike Douglas Mike show? Mike Douglas show. Oh, just watching her talk oh. uh, and doing you her grandmother's voice. Out of, out of central casting because when Kay would imitate her mom, I mean, her grandmother, Nana, and she, she had the great story about her getting her uh, citizenship papers. And um, she, she would imitate her with this great amount of respect and love. And when I was hearing about it, I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I saw the clip of Mike Douglas and I thought, oh, my gosh. <laughs> she just got off the boat, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was absolutely true. And uh, a lot of the things, Kay, before she did the documentary, we were working on maybe not a sequel necessarily, but an addendum to the book where we could 
put in more pictures, some letters, some things, because I think people sometimes will read the book and think she couldn't have known all those people. That's not true. And she had the proof. Yeah. I, it, it's coming from an Italian home. I love the story. Um, you know, with with uh, her grandmother about uh, if you are no weed, you are going to get a TB. <laughs> get a TB. It looks to me like you got a TB. <laughs> Spaghetti, sp spaghetti sandwiches. Uh, spaghetti sandwiches. <laughs> locker, you know, coming. And I mean, think about even that. I think about West Tech. She went to West Tech High School in Cleveland, which is now a um, senior home, I believe. She visited when we when we played Cleveland, um, and they have a plaque up about West Tech. But one of her substitute teachers there you, it was Ross Hunter, the producer. Yes. So. So when she would have her Sunday soirees and you had Gypsy Lee and uh, Gypsy Rose Lee and you had uh, Paul Lynn and all these people and Ross Hunter, I said, well, how, Ross Hunter, how'd you get to know Ross Hunter? Did you do a movie with him? No, he was my substitute teacher when I was in grade school. <laughs> Crazy. And, and, and also Paul Lind was from the same area, essentially, wasn't he? The... Well, I, Paul Lind, yes. I mean, when you think about it, I, I remember watching a Larry King episode with Phyllis Diller, I think. And... Almost everybody on there talking about comedians and uh, uh, fem uh, comedians and comedians, they were all from Cleveland. And I thought, how to be in the water? Center, people were just not, they needed to be cheered up there or something. I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, Tim Conway, uh, and whether it was Cleveland, it was, it was somewhere in Ohio they were from. It's an astounding amount of people. Yeah, yeah. It's now we, we, we mentioned her voice, and this is something that I think a lot of people don't realize about Kay because they know the sitcoms, uh, they know the mothers in law, they, they you know, she guest starred as, as the uh, the klepto gypsy <laughs> in, um, in Alice and all the wonderful comedic performances like the Ritz. But this woman had a voice, and I quote Hugh Martin, who wrote for Judy Garland said the voice is just as good as Judy Garland's. And I, I agree with him. I mean, she had this beautiful voice yeah. and a w lyrics. I mean, all about the lyrics, which today it's not about the lyrics at all with so many of the, the up and coming singers. It's just about hitting these bombastic notes and, and vocal calisthenics. But Kay just had a way with a song. And there's an interesting story. Um, well, I'll impart this now. I was going to wait till later. When I met Kay, it was at the Hollywood Collector Show. I knew she was going to be there. And I said, John, we got to go. We have to go. We have to go. And had my book because I wanted her <laughs> to sign it. And when I saw her at her table, I got starstruck. I just was shaky. And, and I, we, we went around the room almost three times and she kept looking at me and smiling at me and the, the third time she she did this so i walked over to the table and she put her arms around my waist and she said you're italian aren't you <laughs> <laughs> and i said yes miss ballard i am and she said i know i could spot a fellow paisano at 20 paces or something like that so we started talking and and my husband said you know, Peter does Judy, and she said, with those arms, you do Judy. And uh, she, uh, I said, you and I do, talk about the other ladies and how she did tributes and such, and, and I mentioned Liza. Now, a lot of people don't realize this. Maybe this time is not, it may be known as Liza Minnelli's signature song, but it was written for Kay Ballard. And there was a kind of a riff, which I'll let you elaborate on, uh, but I said, you know, just so you know, when I do Liza, I always give you the credit that you're entitled to. <laughs> and she said, I'm glad somebody is. <laughs> but okay. um, yeah, uh, and, and, and giving Liza credit, she has given credit as well. Yes, so, uh, yes. She has given credit for that. Um, and the story really didn't surface until uh, way after the movie of Cabaret. And uh, by that time, she and Fred Ebb had made up, and and Fred Ebb was one of the uh, closest people to her in her life, and and I got to go to dinner with them, um, uh, which if you have time, I'll tell you an amazing story that says a lot about people not understanding their own fame. But uh, yeah, she would, she even brought the record. She had a forty-five, 
uh, maybe this time. And, uh, and she said, not only that, but it's this, you know, they stole my arrangement because it starts, bah, 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 bah. But it, you know, depending, uh, Sandy Stewart has a little bit of a different story about this, but it all has to do with my coloring book and um, a producer on the Perry Como show that, uh, not that he didn't like Kay, but Kay was the comic. Sandy was the pretty singer. And again, in that era, you, you fit your mold, right? And so uh, she always tried to get uh, Fred Ebbs, and even before John, he was with John Kander, material um, and comedy material as well, not just songs, uh, uh, out there. And so anytime she could put it in her act or, or do a song on television, she would do this. And Fred was eternally grateful. Um, and, 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 you know, she introduced Fred to a lot of people. Um, and then that whole thing took off. And, uh, you know, when, once you have Cabaret and the Hal Prince partnership and, and here's Kay at a certain point going, hello, I'm still here. Yeah. And um, speaking of. And so so what happened with that was she um, he said she wanted to sing my coloring book on Pericomo. And uh, they said, no, uh, Sandy will do it if you want. You know, it's a good song. Sandy can do it. She said, yes, please have Sandy do it. Well, it became a minor hit for her, even before Barbara sang it and everybody else. It was a big sensation. And uh, to hear her say it, Fred came to her in tears saying, I am so sorry. I, you know, I'll write you another. She says, I'll write, uh, write me another song maybe next time. Um, and that's, and she, he came back like two days later and said, this is yours. You can have it. And she would imitate him. You can have it forever and ever. And, um, and, uh, I talked to Fred a couple of times and I, I didn't know up until the time that I actually spoke with him that, um, you know, the movie, all that jazz. Yes. Probably everybody in the know knew this, but you know, the musical director who needs a soprano and, oh my gosh, they're, you know, they're, they're ruining my hit song. Uh, well, it's based on Fred. And so he was so sorry, I will, I will you know, I, it's yours forever, I'll never do it. And then here comes the movie of Cabaret, which Fred didn't have anything to do with giving them that song or saying that they couldn't use that song, you know. And, but it did cause a rift for a while. And when the rink went, uh, when she went to see the rink, she, they saw each other in the lobby and ran and hugged and it was all over with. Um, but it's, it's an example of K and K love to go, you know, uh, uh, they saw me coming, you know, they uh, want, here it is again. I, you know, I get this far and nope, no, no nomination or, or whatever it was. And she would joke about it. Yeah. But I think adding up those things, that's probably what she meant about not making it. She would, she would get that close, you know, um, she also recorded Fly Me to the Moon when it was called In Other Words. And she introduced, started, yeah, she introduced the song. Yeah, so so she would, she never forgot those things. And yeah. She would remind people very often that, hey, I did that first. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, it's John. Uh, My so, other half joining us. So you just mentioned something about her, about Kay not knowing perhaps her own celebrity or? Um, well, this is a, I'll try to do this quickly. Um, Again, we were we were on tour and we had a we had a week in New York and so and it was in the winter, and I was uh, Father Virgil and I also was assistant stage manager and so I think I needed to go to the bank and get some per diem or something and it was early in the morning. Kay loved staying at the Edison, and she was at the Edison and I think I dropped something off and then I had to walk about a thousand blocks down to this bank and back and. I came back and I was not the freshest, let's say, and it was right when we first got cell phones and I get a call from Kay and she says, um, where are you? I said, I'm in the lobby. I, I was heading back to where I was staying. She said, oh, good, good. We're going to dinner with Freddie Ebby. And I said, I'm not going to dinner with Freddie Ebby. She said, yes, you are. You know, uh, his limo is going to pull up in the back door. Be, be out there in five minutes. And so um, I had some sort of sweatshirt, sweater on and a beat up jacket and jeans and I think I, I I went into the bathroom. I think I bought a T-shirt that went with my sweatshirt in the gift shop of the Edison. I threw my dirty T-shirt away and I go out and here's this limousine. Um, a guy lets me in and here's Fred Ebb in the front and Kay is in the back. And I think they said hello. I'm not sure. I, I'm thinking I'm in the limousine with Kay and Fred Ebb and we're headed to dinner at Rocco de Spiritos. Um, 
when that had just become famous. And so I'm just listening to them and uh, they're like a brother and sister back and forth. And we had dinner and it was about the time that I, I think I got up the nerve to ask uh, what he thought of Liza getting married again. It was right before David guessed. He wasn't happy with that. Um, and they, they talked. So I just watched them talk the whole time. So we get back in the limo and they're gonna drop me off because, and it's raining. And uh, she is going to take Fred to see the boy from Oz with Hugh Jackman. He hadn't seen it yet, she'd seen it twice. And so we're, we're in the limo and I remember him talking about at that time they had just done the visit in Chicago with Cheetah a couple of years before and they were trying to get it back and we get Angela Lansbury. And I'm still sitting there thinking, they're talking about Angela Lansbury, they're talking about Cheetah Rivera, they're talking about, uh, can I record this, somebody? Um, so we're pulling up to the theater and it's pouring rain and Kay mentions, now when we go back after the show and Fred turns around and says, I'm not going back. Well, you're, you're, yes, you're going back. He doesn't know who I am. No. Oh, Fred, just because you have a crush on him and we're not going to blah, 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 blah. They're, they're fighting. Um, you are going back. And we're pulling up in, you know, in front of the theater. And I remember as Fred is saying, he doesn't know who I am. He doesn't want to meet me. I'm looking out the t window and I'm seeing the marquee of Chicago and going, didn't you write that? Isn't that like on its way to be the longest running revival of any show ever? And yet it was Fred going, I can't meet Hugh Jackman. Don't make me. <laughs> nobody would nobody would believe this. These are just two kids that, who have known each other since they were not famous. And they have not changed a bit. Doesn't matter what they've done in the meantime. So it's still able to get starstruck and and yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. Florence Henderson said the same thing in an interview that she it didn't matter the fame that she achieved. She still got a little bit wobbly in the knees, you know, when she met a star. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think either you put that on and Kay never did. Even at the I mean, she loved going to the Palm Springs Film Festival and she loved seeing those people. She loved movies. Um, but she didn't walk in as the star, you know? She'd wave, she'd be friendly. But like you were saying with, with her calling you over, she had her eye on you. She wasn't playing the star sitting there. Would you like me to sign your book, my book? Um, and I think that comes a bit from maybe the Midwest or what well, definitely comes from how you were brought up. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah. It's, and, and it's funny because she came off as your Italian aunt that you had known for years. She, she didn't play the diva or do you know who I am? You know, here, I, you know, I'm absolutely melting through the floor because I'm like, oh my God, Kate Ballard just put her arms around my waist. Right. But she right. was just so unassuming. It, it, it was... Do you, uh, do you think that in, in the show business of, of uh, well, even today... People have so many managers and agents and, and uh, representatives, and it's always very important for people to be the good guy, right? You get somebody else to do the business so that you can be your commodity. And uh, I think that coupled with Kay, I mean, Kay was no shrinking violet, don't get me wrong. She, you know, she said her, she has said over and over that her mouth was one of her worst enemies um, because she was Italian and she was loud, right? True. And, and what she, did, what she, she would say what she did on mother's in law and biting her hand. She, she hated that. Uh, she kind of put that out there in the world because then she got cast in that over and over and over, but she wasn't that way backstage. And so therefore to fight for a role or to, uh, to, to be that loud, pushy person that she represented maybe outside. Yeah wasn't the person she was behind the scenes. And so it didn't serve her when it came to get the roles or to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to get the next gig, you know? And, and she had, again, the range of what she could do. I know someone in the documentary says she could do, maybe it's Anne Margaret, uh, who says she could, she oh, could have done Shakespeare. Yeah. Well, Harold, um, Hal Prince finally says, you know, they had a little sort of misunderstanding as well. Uh, Hal Prince says, you know, I think if she had, she, you know, I saw her in the tour of Gypsy. I think if she had been on Broadway, it would have blown the, you know, it would have blown everybody's world that if she had done it instead of Ethel Merman. And uh, it, it really is, um, 
maybe because it was so casual. I don't know. When when you hear the imitation on the documentary when she's singing "You Made Me Love You" as Judy, yeah. You don't even think about Judy. I ju I just think, wow, that voice. That that voice, and it's. I remember the first time I heard her sing. Maybe this time, and I got chills, and I still do. Um, a wonderful arrangement of uh, uh, "Sing My Heart." Another one. She, my God, you. Know, it, very few people make the hairs stand up on my neck, but Kay yeah. could do that with her voice. It's, well, it's, and if you blend what you said about the lyrics, because one of my favorite things she ever did uh, later in life was the last song that, um, uh, oh, um, this is horrible, that um, um, the lyricist of um, Over the Rainbow, Yip Harbor. Yip Harbor. Uh, one of the last songs he wrote, uh, she put in her act, and it was uh, um, color my hair with gray, and uh, it was the most beautiful oh, lyrics. Yes, uh, time, time, you old gypsy man. And um, I, I remember she had said, you know, again, giving things away. It wouldn't matter whether she was doing it to you, to me, the cannoli, to the girl sitting at the next table. But she said, you know, she toured in Four Girls Four, and she said, oh, uh, Rosemary Clooney, this is a great song for you. And Rosemary looked at it and said, not yet, not for me. Um, well, show it to Frank, because this would be perfect for him. No, no, no. So she sang it. But it's it's so, such a poignant poem that you have a person who could not only put, you know, have the hair stand up because of the notes she hit, but she can interpret lyrics as well. She's not just out there belting either. It's, 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 it's not just about hearing the singer. It's about feeling them as well, I think. And that's, she had that. And it's not something that, every singer has. So that's, again, watching those clips of her singing, Everything's Coming Up Roses, and Hal Prince was right. Why didn't she play Mama Rose? She would have been brilliant in, in the role. Absolutely brilliant. It's and, and I think she was when she, she basically did it with Ethel's cast after <laughs> Dallas. One but not, but not in, in New York. And then did it again with Gavin McLeod, I think, years later, because she did it with Jack Cassidy first. Um, so she got a chance to do it. Yeah. But even you're on a national TV show, and she got to sing, uh, because after the tour, Perry let her sing, uh, uh, not Rose's turn, I think some people, uh, I can't remember which one. Um, and it's incredible. Yeah. But I don't know. She would say maybe too little, too late, or always the second choice or or whatever the reason um she auditioned for mame she was one of the people that jerry herman played for you know she sang every single song i don't want to hear those because now those are those have circulated out there i guess that there are her audition tapes yeah and and jerry herman played for a bunch of people and they're good i don't know that they're mame and i don't know that she was mame but uh you couldn't knock how she sang it it, it was letter perfect. She, you know, everything she did and her, her one of her biggest uh, regrets of her life was, you know, that Molly, the story of Molly Goldberg, that musical, didn't make it. And she has a couple songs in there that are just heartrending. And again, she could just do it, but she didn't find that right. And and it's not just Kay, but don't you think that if if the vehicle lines up with the person at the right time, with the right audience, then everything explodes. You know, um, if she had done Funny Girl ten years before, I was going to bring that up. Yeah, I, I don't know. Would it have been a hit? We don't know. It would have been a different show, but because of those combinations, and she was readily, you know, she would say she tried so hard with Funny Girl and having the whole Fanny Bryce album and and talking to people whenever she could, and then Barbara does it, and all it takes for Kay is to see it and go, "Yep, that's right." She's right. She's she's the one. Yeah. She she held no grudges on that kind of thing. Because later on, she played the mother in in a touring production of the uh, well, of I the don't show. Know if she toured in it, but she did the concert version with all of the different fannies, and I think Marsha Lewis was in that playing Mrs. Straight Gosh, and and uh, so now she that's, did do it. Then. That's that's interesting to me. What you brought up Marsha Lewis because I was shocked. And I know we're not supposed to endorse bootlegs, but they are out there. <laughs> but no. seeing her, <laughs> seeing her as, I love Marsha, and she was a sweet lady, but I thought, 
did they offer Kay the revival of Chicago, or was it just uh, as as Mama Morton? Because almost that entire Long Beach cast did the nineteen ninety six revival. Yeah, I I didn't. Um, sadly, I never asked Kay about that. I don't know if that was a possibility. I know that I know that Kay uh, was uncomfortable. Let's go back and talk about the creation of Cabaret because yeah. it was their first big hit. But, you know, she was instrumental in the two of them getting together and instrumental in them meeting Hal Prince. And um, so when Cabaret came about, uh, she did ask Fred Ebb, is there a role in it for me? And I, she didn't do that. I don't think as many famous people as she knew and, and uh, she loved Gower Champion, always said he was her champion because he used her in, in film and uh, uh, in Carnival and but she wasn't one that would call Gower Champion and say, could I be in your next movie? Or Fred, do you have something for me? As close as they were. So I can't imagine that she would have ever lobbied for something like that. Yeah. Now, after the fact, at dinner, once the show had already opened, she would have said, I could have done that better. <laughs> she, um, it seems to me like Molly was one of the, the great heartbreaks of her life. Um, and that they really, uh, I'm going to clean up my language here, they really screwed her over. It seemed, th th those, she said, just when we thought we had it right, they upended me and, and said, oh, here's a new first act for you. Well, I think, um, I think what happened was that it was, it was, I remember her saying that it was the only time she really did speak up because it was the first time her name was above the title and she felt responsible. And so she did yell and she did say, this is not going to work. Yeah. And uh, they were trying so hard. And uh, her, her assessment of at least what uh, it started out to be, and maybe it started to be fixed when um, they got a new director. Uh, but she said the sets were too drab and the, uh, uh, she she sort of instinctively knew what was wrong, but she didn't have the power to fix it, and she didn't have a strong director. Yeah. And I mean, you hear that all the time. I remember Elaine Stritch saying that about about you know she's a strong woman, but she said I need a strong director. And uh, so then the director disappears when they're still in trouble, and they're they're going to go into New York anyway. And they said, well, we'll fix it after we open. And she lost it and she said no there's no recovering from a bad opening especially then because it was an opening rather than opening for a month and um we cannot get this back and then the the, the director the poor director shows up and has rewritten the entire second act and she just lost it and said no this is not going to happen now um i think they did everything they could in terms of um uh, even if it wasn't a big hit with uh, because Molly Goldberg was so loved and, you know, with uh, theater parties and things like that, I think they thought it was going to go and that might have given it a chance. But uh, the record we have of her singing the last song in the show is from the Carol Burnett show because Carol was gracious enough to allow her to come on and basically plug the show. Yeah. Which I thought was great. And we have the record of her singing Going the Best of Health. Just seeing the little clip in the documentary, she, she breaks your heart. She absolutely, again, had that ability to, to draw you in and, and, away, and away with a song. And, and, and be funny as well. I mean, her the mothers-in-law cracks me up. <laughs> I just wish it had had a longer, well, I know she did too, you know, that it should have had a longer lease on oh, life. Okay. That, that's another, when, when you stack up the things that were, that you couldn't control, but you think, really, that happened then? Had mothers-in-law been two years earlier, maybe it would have gotten its groove and had a longer run because of the era we were in. But now, when you have the big, uh, at the same time, mothers-in-law, you know what replaced mothers-in-law? The first Bill Cosby show, where he was a basketball coach, and we're going to be, oh, modern and... Um, uh, so, so that's the, the, the paradigm shift that they were even trying to do in the second season. You could tell by the, by the, uh, the, uh, dresses and the, the things that were, they were talking about. So they had an I Love Lucy. They had a Desi Arnaz show, 
Right. But I think they were trying to quickly bump it up to the mod generation with storylines that were still back in I Love Lucy, right, with the same writers. And it wasn't that it was bad. It was that, that it was 1968, 69. We are in political turmoil. And uh, look what happens on CBS. All their top shows that, that, you know, the slashing of the Country Bumpkin show was happening. And so I think Mothers in Law was a victim of that as well. They didn't, it wasn't like Gomer Pyle or uh, Petticoat Junction. Yeah. But it was that same, for years you watch those shows and from 69 to 71, everything changes. And everything also changes in that uh, All in the Family comes on. Carol O'Connor says, you're making tons of money. I'm not coming back as Archie until you pay me a million dollars. And Kay was making 4000 a week. And she thought that was good, you know? Um, well, because we're, now I'm going to forget the actor's name, the first husband on uh, The Roger Mothers in Law. Carmel. And, and, you know, he was like giving them a hard time about wanting a raise. $100. And, $100 yeah. more. But it wasn't cake like, you know, we're, we're not getting it. Eve Arden isn't getting it. <laughs> yeah, she said, she said, you know, Eve's only gets 7,000 and we're all good for going to forego our raise because we want to come back. Yeah. And so he was, you know, kind of like the, the two Darrens and everything and all the stuff that was happening that way with, with uh, oh, we can, we can just replace a major character. That's what they do with Muslim Law. Didn't tell anybody, just got Richard Deacon to do it. Um, but, but she said, you know, I mean, from what I know about Roger C. Carmel, he wasn't the easiest either. Very talented man. Yes. But he says, no, you know, Toots, it's the principle of the thing. <laughs> but, you know, but it, back then, one, one more season, syndication would have given her money past that. So uh, that, that's another aspect of it that, you know, Kay goes, yep. And, you know, that's as much as she would do. She would, she would... I have a little notepad where uh, she, I think it was a show she was doing off Broadway and it only lasted a few shows or something. And so I have the pad that they would uh, sell tickets on and she wrote her little s smiley face, but she put a, a, a mad face on it and she wrote, grr. <laughs> <laughs> that turned it into that. She would not complain about those things. She would say, yep, they, you know, uh, Lucky's back in town. That's great. We, we have quite a number of questions. Oh, we have questions. Let's, yeah. let's field questions. I have quite a number of answers. I hope they match. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people have asked this question. Kip Powell, Sean Sanborn Reed. They're curious. Um, is there a particular uh, were Eve, Arden, and Kay friends? And uh, is there a, a backstage story you can tell us about Kay and Eve working together? Um, nothing salacious. I think they were very good friends. I think they uh, traveled in different circles, so it wasn't that they had dinner parties all the time, though they did, you know, they go, they went to each other's house and, and um, they enjoyed each other. I don't think, I have this sneaking suspicion that people sort of want to uh, give it the Vivian Vance, Lucille Ball treatment. And, you know, the show only lasted two years. And also, Kay was this fan of Eve Arden as a movie star and, and whatever, whatever Eve wanted, you know, you're going to stand on this side. That's my good side. Okay. Whatever you say. Eve. <laughs> um, and so Kay, Eve was a little bit more established as a, as a television person with Armis Brooks and uh, uh, the Desi Lou people and just in LA in general. And Kay was going off doing nightclubs still, you know, and her hiatus. And she was, she was working all the time. So um, backstage story-wise, she would always, when I ask about Eve Arden, she'd say she loved to sing and dance. She said Eve Arden would sing and dance over anything in the world. And I think she ended up being one of the dollies after Carol left. Um, and, um, and she did say she, you know, she wasn't great at it, but she loved to sing. She could so sell it. <laughs> she said she said it was it was great for me and on the uh, mothers-in-law uh, DVDs there's an extra she's interviewed and there's an extra of them rehearsing a song and dance number for the show and you see the sort of the backstage rehearsal of it with her and Eve and I think that sums up their relationship um, but but again I, I just get the feeling that people wanted it to be Lucy and Vivian Vance and that's not really what it was yeah it, it also mentioning Eve Arden 
if you get a chance, guys, go online and watch Eve Arden. The, the name of the movie escapes me. She does a song. It's set in the army. It, she's in a, in a female barracks. You know, the lieutenant or whatever the role she's playing. And she sings a song called The One That Got Away. And it is hysterical. Because Eve, Eve's range was about this big. She was not a kid. <laughs> but she sells that song and struts her stuff. <laughs> Watch it. It's totally worth watching. Eve Arden had her shtick. You know, yeah. you can see it in the movie of Grease. You can see it in our Miss Brooks. You see it in the Mothers-in-Law. She had her shtick, and Kay fit hers within that. Yeah. And uh, I think that's not always easy to do. And, you know, my again, my family loved Mothers-in-Law because, and I think it's for the same reason I do, growing up in an Italian family, what Kay brought to it. Uh, which I saw many people in my family do, yeah. you know, and, you know, wishing to go off into Italian. I mean, she, she, she didn't like that she got pegged there, but she would use it. I mean, yeah. she would, even at dinner, she would, she, she was known to say, oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's because uh, that's nothing the writers gave her, and, and I'm sure the writers didn't give her that. And yeah. uh, uh, she, she, I think, got a little flack from her family for that because it wasn't a nice thing to do, but she got known <laughs> for it. But if you watch a couple episodes like the making the Italian meatballs, that's perfect. You know, watching the wasp try to make the meatballs, and she just watches her. And then uh, the, the probably the, the pilot, the first episode with the piano where she sings. If you have not heard where, where Eve is playing the piano and she's going to sing, Oh, Promise Me. And she says, what, five times? She says, higher. I can do that higher. I mean, right there, you have a five-minute clip of that's her voice. It's yeah. incredible. And she does it, you know, with nothing. But then when she's, it's raining and she's holding on to the piano and you see what the relationship is going to be. She's a loudmouth Italian next to this wasp who's afraid that her china is going to be broken. The only other person I I know who could who could do that and told the story I think publicly was Nell Carter, um, that she she it wasn't in the context of of give me a break the sitcom but it was she was doing a show and and they had her understudy with her and Nell kept saying no half a step another half a step another half a step another half a step and finally the understudy said I can't sing it in that key and and Nell said that's the key. <laughs> 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 oh, so, but I you know I love her too as Mrs. Pellucci in the Doris Day show. I wish they had yeah. spun her and Bernie off because they were perfect. I think well the Doris Day show is is kind of schizophrenic. It's all over the place. Well, yeah, I mean, are you on a farm? Do you still have kids? Um <laughs> you see TV shows now that sort of play fast and loose with that but that was really the first one that went we don't care what you do you're doris day so we're going to put you in this office and we're going to give you this cast and this cast and we're just going to keep changing it around and so that was part of what gave Kay the opportunity yeah but at the same time things were shifting so fast you didn't know who was where yeah but she loved working with uh she loved doris day obviously but she loved working with mr uh, Bernie. Well, Bernie, yes, but uh, the gentleman lived downstairs. Uh, oh, oh, oh my God. Um, uh, Frosty the Snowman. Yes, he, she would, he would uh, say, uh, somebody would say something about his- Billy DeWolf. Yes. Billy DeWolf. <laughs> Mr. DeWolf. Mr. DeWolf, she, she could do him better than Billy DeWolf. <laughs> she would tell Billy DeWolf stories of, you know, if somebody mentioned anything about the hair, we don't discuss it. <laughs> uh, and my favorite is that, that uh, you know, they had, he had brothers and sisters and, and uh, uh, were you always called Mr. DeWolf? And, and, oh yes, mother would call us in for dinner. Oh, Billy, oh, Susie, Mr. DeWolf. <laughs> She, she had great stories of, of, of him. Yeah, and it seemed in watching the documentary how much she did love Doris Day. And what I found interesting is that she loved the format because Doris didn't work with a live studio audience. And 
I, I was surprised that Kay said she enjoyed the format because usually live performers do not, uh, you know, enjoy working with a laugh track. So I was, I was really surprised that she said she enjoyed the format. Uh, I think Kay, Kay was great at nightclubs, but I don't think she liked that format. I think she could do it. Yeah. I think she loved Broadway. Okay. Number one, because it was set. And so therefore, love the audience response, but you weren't making it up. Right. You weren't dealing with hecklers. So then you go into a nightclub and that's live performance, but it's a totally different thing with smoke and you know, you're not the center of attention all the time and you have to fight. Yeah. And who knows how it's gonna go tonight. You, you can't land that lap always. And then you go to television and you have a live audience. And back then, especially at Desilu, they tried to do it like a play where it would go all the way through. So she enjoyed that, but she always liked film because you could do it again. And because you could look at yourself. And she said, you know, I was always too big for television. Why didn't they tell me? And mothers-in-law, she would watch and say, why didn't they tell me not to shout? And I said, Kay, you're fine. It's, it's a perfect character, but I got known for that. And I should have done it. And I said, Kay, if you had if you'd brought Kay Buell down, it wouldn't have worked. But she always felt that she, in that switch from medium to medium that she never got, which is what she said later, she wanted to do the movie of Over the River and Through the Woods, this play that she had played the Italian grandmother in. She said, I want to show people that I can act and yeah. not just perform. Yeah. We, we actually have a question. Question. This is, this is a question that's also come from a couple of different people. Uh, but Brian Judd, Noticed this too. Uh, we we rewatched the documentary last night um, about Paul Lind. She mentions in the documentary that he was jealous of her. Um, do you have anything you can add to that? I think Paul Lind was jealous of a lot of people. Um, I think he wasn't a happy man, and um, but a wonderful man, very talented. She loved him to death. At a certain point, had to cut him off. Like if you will read other biographies uh, that certain friends did. You know, um, I, I happened to work a little bit with Bill Asher and we had talked about Paul Lind as well because of Bewitched. And he was his own worst enemy, especially when he was drinking. And Kay did not, for whatever reason, certainly uh, tolerate people drinking very well. She would just divorce herself from that. She'd go away. And so I think where she might have said he was jealous was at the time when he was trying to do, he had a Sherlock Holmes series that didn't go. He had the Paul Lynn show that didn't go. He was sort of being relegated to going on stage in Summerstock or game shows or, and he was so talented. I think what he saw in Kay and similarly to in Alice Ghostly, a very good friend of his. Yeah. All of these nightclub people, Charlotte Ray, um, he saw the ability to go further than he was going in those different mediums. And I think that frustrated him. That's just my conjecture. Uh, but, but I know that she loved him and I know that she thought she was incredibly talented. If you, I'm not sure it's in the documentary, but there's a, there's a, a, a sketch on the Perry Como show with Paul Lynn where uh, it, they play a prize fighter she plays a female prize fighter and, and uh, 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 she comes up and she gives him a whack on the shoulder. They're hysterical together. Yeah. They did a lot of sketches together where they were just perfect together. Um, so I think that jealousy was superficial, um, just more frustration in his own career. And, and she said, you know, he would become just mean, you know, and, and make fun of her and make fun of her weight. And they, I think, he burned a hole in her carpet or something and you know she said come on i'm not making the kind of money you are you know that that you know you res please respect my properties that, that she didn't have any tolerance for the uh no she know. didn't but she also knew that it wasn't just her yeah he, he wasn't picking on her he would yeah. do that you know, if he was drinking he'd do it to wherever he was yeah and so she knew enough there to not take it personally but she wasn't going to tolerate it and not be she wasn't going to be around it you know now, she was part of something that is television history, and that was Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Did, she, she obviously had, must have had fond memories oh, of yeah. being a part of the experience. 
Um, and, and a lot of these you can read in the book or see on the documentary. The yes. ones that stick out were um, uh, just having tears running down her face when Oscar Hammerstein in the read through just basically read the words to, do I love you because you're beautiful, you know? And so simple and, you know, uh, just gave her chills. She loved, she was in awe. There are pictures, you can see her watching Julie Andrews recording and you can just see it in her face, the awe that she has. Um, she loved working with the king and queen and their names are gonna escape me. They were- um, uh, uh, Dorothy, Stewart, Dorothy Stickney. And? And her husband, right? Wasn't it her husband? And uh, yep. Mr. Stickney. Mr. Oh. <laughs> Good one. That's it. That's it. You young people, you young people, look it up. Anyway, they, <laughs> she said it would be so sweet because in between uh, rehearsals, because they only did that one take, in between rehearsals, uh, they brought paper bag lunches and they would sit in the throne thing and eat lunch together. Um, so she loved talent. She loved Alice Ghostly, her good friend, and doing that. She did say it was nerve wracking because it hadn't been done before in one sort of take and all of the magic kind of things that they had to do. She didn't like that John Cipher was, uh, because of the kinescope, he was a handsome guy, but he didn't come across as Prince Charming, and so that didn't help his career. Um, I will say, though, with Rick McKay, I, I know we mentioned this off the air, Rick McKay was a brilliant document, documentarian that uh, did Broadway The Golden Age, which she loved and she is in, and was on his way to doing more of these uh, these invaluable historical Broadway records. So important. Um, and while he was, before he premiered the first one, they had run across the kinescope uh, in uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein found it. It hadn't been released yet. She had never seen it because it was played, delayed played out on the, on the um, West Coast. And she thought she saw some of it one time in a kinescope on somebody's sheet in a house or something that they had an old, but she had never seen it. You know, millions and millions of people saw this thing, but she never saw it. So he said, well, we have it. And, and uh, Rogers Hammerstein is going to release it on DVD. And she was thrilled. And she said, he said, how would you like to be the first one to see it? And so he took us over to the Museum of Television and um, Science. And we went into a little room, he had a little monitor, and I have a picture of her sitting there in her winter coat, and she's watching herself sing um, uh, Stepsister's Lament. Yes. And she, just to herself, she said, I always thought I was fat. It was just so poignant to me. I mean, here's this gorgeous, I mean, Kay was gorgeous. She's a showgirl gorgeous. Beautiful, no, beautiful no, eyes and, 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 and sensuality. She had a sensuality about her. Yeah, but that was never something she was comfortable with. And she would joke with, with Nana saying, I don't want you to you know, show your legs. <laughs> she would joke about, about those things, um, but she wasn't comfortable with it. And so to see her all those years later, watch herself and think, well, I don't look so bad. It was just, you know, it was great to see that. Pretty, pretty lady. Pretty, pretty lady, yeah. And guys, just I've, I've got to do another plug for the book, which Jim co-authored with Kay, How I Lost 10 Pounds in 53 Years. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's, it's touching and it's funny and she speaks from the heart. And also there's the audio version, which we've got here. And this is one of my used copies. You can tell because it's cracked within an inch of its life. <laughs> On the, uh... and I will I will say something about the audio version. She recorded that. Um, I, I blew up the book so that she could read every page. And uh, as she recorded it, the reason it's four discs, because the book is not that long, is because she would go off on tangents and start singing or telling another story. So you have the book on that tape along with her reminiscences. So that's, you know, a step up. And then you have the documentary to seal it you know, all off. So you need to do all three. There, there is this story she tells on here. I remember the first time I'm looking at my other half here now that we were listening to it. I think we we're on our way to Las Vegas and for, for the weekend. <laughs> and it's being an acting class. I don't, think, I, I don't know if it, if it had to do with the method or whatever. And <laughs> she goes, <laughs> you know, the, the, the teacher is going on and on about this and you have to feel this and you have to feel that. And, and, and her response was, okay, that's enough of that shit. <laughs> well she was they, she had a couple stories she, she was there with Marilyn and and Marilyn was 
singing some song I can't, and she would sing the song I can't remember and sort of bouncing up and down and everybody saying how terrific it was and she's like well of course it was terrific it's Marilyn Monroe bouncing up and down what, what's wrong with that? <laughs> it was, and I'm going to get this wrong but it, uh, he's no longer with us either I think it was George Papard maybe and um, yes. she, she, sits, she sits down and he's looking off into the distance and it's forever and nothing's happening and so she leans over, and I think she it was she leaned over to Maureen Stapleton. She said, "What is he doing? He's watching it rain." And then and she was like, "No." And uh, I think so. that's it. That's the story. Yeah. When she tried to work with Lee Strasberg, he was having her sip a glass of water. There was no water, and there was no glass, and uh, she just didn't see the point. Get me a glass and get me some water. I'll drink it. <laughs> so I think also she she did respect that so much. And there was a there's an interview which I told you I would try to find for you that I believe it's it's either Cup Show, but I think it's Studs Turkle. And it was in Chicago when she was playing at Mr. Kelly's in the early 60s, I think. And she was talking about, it could have been late 50s. And she was talking about her upbringing in Cleveland and her father who who could still t take you around Cleveland and say, we laid that cement in 1942. We laid this over here. And uh, so proud of this working class family that was so solid, right? And any time they would ask her something that, that, you know, was maybe a slightly intellectual, she would sort of become this sort of little girl that said, oh, I don't know anything about that. And she would joke because I don't think she had confidence in how actually smart she was. She barely graduated high school. She was not paying attention there. She wanted to get into show business, but that left her with a, a confidence barrier that uh, she would always down. And, and, and eventually whatever tension there was between her mother and herself, she said vanished essentially on her mother's deathbed. Yeah, basically her mother reaching up to her with her arms and the look on her face was all she needed to know that she basically realized right there her mother was saying i did the best i could yeah and yeah. and then she realized that she did the best she could there was nothing you know i mean mother daughter relationships in general but with this with this girl who went off and did show business but they were you know they came to see her in vegas and her father would greet the people at, at the door when she was playing the lounge and thank them for coming to his daughter's show, you know, so, so there was a whole lot of pride there, but you don't, it's not the kind of family that, that, uh, that publicizes that kind of, uh, success, you know? Now, of course, one of the other big moments in her life was the Ritz, which is hysterical. And she's just, she steals the movie. She just steals the movie. I mean, you got Treat Williams in the towel, and that's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> well, she and, she and Jack Weston, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's almost a shame. I feel bad for Rita Moreno in a way, in that the stage show, I think, was, you know, she was the, the star there. And then yeah. the movie sort of divided it out evenly because of what it had to be. And, and um, uh, she was happy with that movie, but again, it was at the time when she was trying to get out of the loudmouth Italian, and what did she go do, which she did brilliantly, but the loudmouth wife who comes in and, you know, I mean, that's why she was cast. Same thing as Coach and Freaky Friday or whatever. She was never cast as a thoughtful, diminutive, you know, uh, shrinking violet, but, but there was a double-edged sword there in that how am I going to prove that I can act if I can only do this? I remember a movie she did with Robbie Benson. I haven't seen it in years where she's, Modern, again, what is it? Which Modern one is it? Love, I think. Yeah, she, and again, she's the very kind of overbearing mother-in-law, it, it, it seemed to me. I have not seen it. They used to run it late night on, on ABC, but um, she was wonderful in it. But again, as you say, there was kind of this mold and it seemed like that was the Kay Ballard stereotype and she was and anxious you know what's what's ironic about that towards the end and um she would number one she had a hang up she she didn't she couldn't believe that modern stars would make as much as they made yeah because she was right there at the edge before they started making it right and to go from four thousand dollars to a week to a hundred thousand dollars an episode 
yeah. was mind blowing to this woman, right? So nobody, it wasn't a denigration of their talent, but nobody was worth that much money. And so of all the shows she auditioned for, and when we were on tour, I was on tour with uh, Georgia Engel as well. She auditioned for Ray Romano's mother in Everybody Loves Raymond. Perfect. She, was, she would have been brilliant. Perfect. So, so, but then you go, you fought for these decades. You, you made a name for yourself as this overbearing Italian mother. You fought for decades not to play that. You go audition and you don't get the role. I mean, that was another way she would, you, she would go, Lucky's back in time. I always wondered if she was ever up for a role on the Golden Girls. First of all, I thought it would be an oxymoron to, to have had her on that show. And it's interesting, after the show was ended, and then they went off and did Golden Palace, and, and, and everyone's like, oh, they shouldn't have done it. They shouldn't have done it without B. Arthur. I said, you know, I think if they had brought Kay Ballard onto the show because she already had the Italian thing going on, and she still would have towered over Estelle. Because <laughs> um, interestingly enough, I, I think it's Diana Mulder, who's a, a, a brilliant actress, but they courted her to, um, to play Dorothy's sister. I always forget. Dorothy's sister was... Oh, um, I should know this, because we do the Golden Girls. But um, Gloria. Um, and I thought... God, she's so against hype. Like, Kay Ballard would have been brilliant as, you know, again, I could just see her and Estelle sparring with each other. She would have been wonderful. I, I don't think she had, um, uh, I don't know that there was that opportunity, but what's interesting to me is she's very good friends. She was great friends with Betty White. Um, her nickname was Teens. And uh, so she knew all these people. And again, I don't think she, at that point, even would put herself out there. She didn't have the, the agent at that time to say, how about Kay Ballard? How about, how about this? Yeah. Uh, so it's actually funny because Peter and I do the Golden Girls Live. It's how we pay our bills. But um, a good friend of ours is one of the original producers of the show. She won three Emmys for it, Marsha Posner Williams. So she was our guest a few weeks ago here. She's actually watching right now. Oh, hey, Marsha. Yeah, and she just, she said, coincidentally, her, her husband, Wayne Williams, is a, very well respected photographer in SoCal. And he actually did a picture of Kay uh, with her flute and her dog that she thinks was taken for the show evening at the improv. Um, she's trying to find it. Uh, but um, she said she doesn't recall that Kay was considered. I'm actually texting with her right now. She doesn't recall that she was considered, but she agrees that she would have been amazing. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times if you're not, you know, that's the struggle, isn't it? Even today, if you're not out there in the public eye and the public, the public changes so quickly. You know, we were talking about the monumental people that, that we grew up with just disappearing. And uh, so it's a chore to do that. But what's it made me think, I know that Elaine Stritch had a story about auditioning for um, Golden Girls, which is a whole different thing and very funny. Um, but. <laughs> But in the beginning of Kay's book, you know, when they were all young actresses that, that would they were going out for everything. Again, I wish I could have been in the room, but there's at one point uh Kay is auditioning, I think it's to go over to England in um uh, that's the ticket, if that's right. Okay. And uh and all the typical people that were there, you know, that, that would always show up at the auditions. You get to know them because you're always the same type. And so there you are with Mary Wicks, Elaine Stritch, B.B. Osterwald, Kay. I think there were a couple more. And, and the way she knew it was because uh, they were all in there for their final reading. And, and Mary Wicks says, um, well, I have to go. I have to go see a follow. I have to go to the flower show at Madison Square Garden. So she says, uh, uh, good luck, Kay, or something, and somebody says, Bon voyage, Kay. They all knew that Kay got the role, right? But you think all of these people who went on to have these incredible careers, B. Arthur being one of them as well, they were all competing with each other for years in New York for, for a lot of those roles. Yeah. And then some of them get to be super superstars on television 50 years later. She, she said something, too, that, uh, again, about the change in the business, Hollywood in particular, but I know Valerie Harper once said something about, you know, now you go down to meet the suits and the suits, you know, you're old enough to be their grandmother 
their fetuses in a in a three piece suit. But the fact that a lot of the younger and it pains me to say that uh, they don't have a reverence or a respect for those who came before. And Kay's attitude was, I'm not saying we shouldn't have the young. Yes, the young people should be running the business, but they don't seem to have a reverence or a respect for those who came. They, they, is it, they almost want to wash it all away and, and you know, forget the Judy Garlands and the, and then that seemed to bother Kay, and it bothers me too. I think the reason is, and it's, I, I think as a performer, you're forced into it because it's a business. If you look at what's happened to New York becoming corporate, it's a, it's for in some ways it's a good thing you couldn't have a, a, a beauty and the beast or, or a lion king or a you know uh they cost so much money that in some, but it's changed the character of everything you also can't have a show that flops after two nights you look at an old theater world and show after show flop what did people lose all this money and they were paying what five dollars and fifty cents a ticket um i think there's a parallel to to film as well and television because I had a friend also that said uh, it's an older actress that got a guest star uh, role and it hadn't been on television for a long time and before there were two writers and they would give you some changes maybe but then she said uh, a younger actor when we were done rehearsing said okay let's go hit the wall and she said what do you mean and it was you're going to go down the go into the audience and go down the row of all of these writers, all of these showrunners, like 16 people, yeah. they're all going to give you a note on how you said something or how you did this. And she said it was mind boggling. By the time I got the end, I had no idea what I was doing. But it was because it's so important as a business. And, um, you know, to, to make art a business, art's not going to win. A lot of times yeah and and so therefore the the young performers that you see you think oh, why don't they know these people or why don't they have respect i think they should go look at b lily because she was brilliant and and they should steal everything that she ever did but do they have time they're they're too concentrated on i have to get out there and and have my um facebook page and my i have to i have to i only have this much time to get out there so i think the pressure is so great that we've lost a lot, but I don't know that it's necessarily any particular generation's fault. Yeah. It, it, it is a, another- Hey would have been gone in that conversation. She would have been gone getting a cannoli. Like, like <laughs> but, uh, stop analyzing. It's, it's funny because we were, you know, now the, the title of the book is hysterical, but apparently one of the other titles was Just One More Cannoli. Was that one of the- Oh, I think there's a list in there, isn't there? I mean. Just one more cannoli. I'm surprised that it's even still in, you know, that we ever got it in print because once it was there, it would change every day. Every day. Um, Buy this book or I'll kill you. That was another one. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that was taken. That was taken off the ad. Remember, the, there was a, do, a a puppy ad where there was a gun against a puppy's head. Buy this magazine or I will kill this dog. Do you remember that ad? That's right. Um, that was sort of Kay's humor. Um, I think she also said Alice Faye had given her her title, which is Red Carpet My Ass. That was one of the- Red Carpet My Ass. <laughs> That's right. But, and in the end, you know, there's a whole list of thank yous. They're not in alphabetical order. She did that on purpose so that people had to hunt for their name. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, you got to read it. You have to, you, you have to read it. I can't, or, you know, I think, you know, the, the thing that was a everything else and what you were saying about younger generations, if Kay could give you any, if it wouldn't be remember me, it would be look at, I'm telling you about Marie Chevalier. I'm telling you about Jerry Lewis. I'm telling you about Carol Channing. Um, she was to, to her dying breath. She was appalled that Carol Channing was not given the Kennedy Center. How dare they? You know, um, yeah. she she never put herself forward like that. She was always about we have this incredible history. These people are amazing. Uh, she had great Ethel Merman stories, and she 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 just wanted people to remember and to 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 give them their due and to value them. It, it's funny. You, you it's it's something that 
Roddy McDowell said to Victoria Price, um, Vincent Price's daughter, the, which she was in a room one night, and you know, there's Aunt Jane Russell, and there's a uh, Robert Mitchum, and yeah, and I guess she was kind of awestruck, and and Roddy pulled her aside and said, Hollywood has a history, but they don't know it. So you better be observing everything that's going on here tonight, you know, and that you're going to be the one to, you know, put those stories out there for the, you know, for the generations. Just think how lucky you are what you're observing tonight. Yeah. And, and the thing is, when you distill the, it's not evil because it's business. So the business doesn't make any money from that history. But we come from a craft. And so you go back to vaudeville, you go back to how you learned your craft. Yeah. You maybe learn it in school now, or you have more opportunities in schools, but it's a craft like furniture making. So therefore it was very important that these things pass down from uh, George M. Cohen or Eddie Cantor or B. Lilly or any of these people because they got them from somebody else. Yeah. And, and so that's how a craft is passed down. And I think that's the sadness that, not, I mean, I think people today are, you know, 10 times in some ways more talented than ever because of their skill level. But sometimes they don't have that depth. Sometimes they don't know where that came from. And, uh, you know, a good joke is a good joke. Kay knew that. Kay knew how to make people laugh over a period of 60 years. And I, I think that's invaluable. So maybe we'll get back to it sometime, but it's important that we keep, you know, her book and her documentary are there for when somebody comes across them and wants to read about them. She also uh, had a wonderful story about her father saying to her, I guess, once when, when she started making a living, you know, yeah, yeah, I want you to put a $10 away out of the paycheck and you know, look at it till you're 60. And, and she said, I didn't do it. Why? I didn't think I would live to be well, 60. <laughs> yeah. you know, I think also... Um, this is probably not telling tales out of school. Anybody that knew Kay knew she loved to gamble. She loved the casino. She loved slot machines. She absolutely loved them. You, you, you guys would have got along great. <laughs> and, and so I, I tell you, I never saw Kay and Gypsy, but I'll tell you, I think I did. I saw a moment of it. And she would always say, you know, because she wasn't good at it either. Um, <laughs> she, would, she would always say, why do I love this? Because she would get such a high if she hit something, right? So we were leaving a casino in Palm Springs one time and, and uh, there was a Wheel of Fortune dollar machine. And she would pick until the last, it was like Jack Guilford in that Cracker Jack commercial, the last little string in her purse down to the nubbin, she would say. And she, we were headed out to the door and, and she stopped and she's, oh. she put it in and she hit $1,000. And Kay made this pose like Gypsy like Mama Rose, like you've never seen, just, and it was electric. I said, oh my gosh, Kay, I, I didn't get to see you in Gypsy, but I think I just saw the end of the bow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because she would say, she would say, why do I get this thrill? But when I watched her go on, she was, uh, it, would, it was very difficult to go through nonsense because we did it in Green Bay, Wisconsin in the middle of the winter. And uh, so it was tiring. And Kay, I would watch Kay backstage get ready to go on for the next scene. And she, it was like that story you hear of Joey Brown when he was doing Showboat when he was 110. Um, not that Kay was 110, but she had that energy that when the lights hit her, boom, there it was. And so that adrenaline that she got from those performances, whether it was nightclubs or Broadway or whatever it was, that adrenaline not only kept her alive, she needed more of it, she wanted more of it. And I, I don't think that's any different than winning that thousand dollars in a way. It's just a replacement for it. She really was, in, again, and going back, and we, we did rewatch the documentary last night, so underrated. It's the one thing I keep coming back to is that I just, she really didn't get her due. I, 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 don't, I don't think she did get her due as... Well, I, I'll ask you a question. If you were going to wind back time and give her her due, what would you give it to her in? I can answer that question oh. from, my, from my perspective. <laughs> I think it's unbelievable. I saw her on stage in Pirates of Penzance. I saw it three times. I do not understand how that woman 
was not even nominated. It doesn't make sense. Uh, I think Marilyn Cooper won that year for Woman of the Year. Well, she didn't. For, for Pirate, she didn't originate the role. No. Uh, so then she, all right, so then she couldn't so have won. That yeah. does make sense. So then she couldn't have won the Tony. So yeah. that totally makes sense. Yeah. But, you know, Carnival, she was not nominated. Um, uh, I, everything I read about what she did in Carnival was just as great. Um, but, I, but again, are you going to be, uh, is it is it Sutton Foster fame? Is it Patti LuPone fame? Is it Katherine Hepburn winning an Oscar fame? Is it uh, Candace Bergen on television winning so many Emmys she has to turn them down fame? Because she was a chameleon and could do it all, what would that look like? That she, why, why didn't she make it? Because I don't think it was, you know, you almost have to dissect her and give her the fame in these different areas, especially when she was in her prime. You couldn't be all three. I mean, there was no award that said you are the greatest movie, television, Broadway, nightclub actress ever. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're actually streaming across several different Facebook groups. Uh, we're on Broadway Babylon, uh, for example. And so now everybody is commenting uh, what they think she should have been nominated for. And, and people are, who did see the original Carnival, who did see Golden Apple and said it was such a stunning performance. And in many ways, she was the, that show and you saw a different part of her. A guy named uh, Tom, Tommy yes. Carlson just said, I, I saw the original yeah, production buddy. of Carnival and it was perhaps one of the best stage performances I have ever seen. So, and then another person said, how is it possible that she wasn't nominated for the Ritz? I think that's because a lot of times comedy doesn't get the recognition that, that it deserves. But it, a lot of people are commenting on how is it possible she didn't win a single award. Well, I, I think Carnival in particular, because she was, I mean, in the beginning of her prime there, and it was such a showy role, um, just in terms of supporting actress. Um, she had great songs. What a great character. Golden Apple, too, going from an off-Broadway theater to Broadway, and really, I mean, being on the cover of Life, that was sort of, she wasn't quite known yet, but uh, you can't quite get much bigger than that at that point, and Lazy Afternoon, and and so I don't know who was up for the awards at, in that year, but she certainly had the, it wasn't like she didn't, we couldn't pinpoint those places where, yes, she should have been nominated for an award. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, lifetime achievement is the only thing that, that, that you know, can, can if, if, if you're going to put them all together and you know, just that it would have been nice perhaps for her to have gotten something in the end that would have said, you did it all and we, and we recognize that. I mean, of course. And she did, she did a bit, um, not from the big academies that she wanted to, but, uh, you know, she won a Mac Lifetime Achievement Award for mm -hmm. uh, uh, being on in nightclubs and, and her act and things like that. Um, it was, it was, she, she would have been happy that she was included in the, uh, y y the People We Lost obituaries the next year. Yeah. Um, I was watching for those and I think, uh, you know, smiling up going there you are Kay. Mm. she would have been happy with that um but it, it, again it was she never retired it was the work and she might have said oh i did i didn't get the recognition i wanted to get but it's not like she stopped she was still looking for that next movie yeah well it, it's you mentioned b arthur and b arthur said that you know we don't it, it, if we're smart we don't retire we just eventually we go. <laughs> that's you know. You you, you never we stop. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's it. You want to. You Rue McClanahan. Same thing. You know. I want to drop dead when I'm. She said when I'm 85 on stage, I'll, I'll hit the big note and just die. <laughs> and Betty White said, "Do you think that we could at, just give us the date so we could advertise in advance?" <laughs> It'd be a sellout, but it, but it's true. You don't, you know, and most performers will say, I'm not going to retire. I'm going to, you know, go until I drop. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think she also, uh, she loved Betty Davis and she loved that Betty Davis kept her Oscar as a doorstop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So even if Kay had won those, I don't think they would have necessarily been in some glass case for everybody to drive by and ogle. I think they would have been a doorstop or, you know, something for the puppies to play with. Also, too, let me sharpen my point, as they say, in terms of getting her to, I think awards are great. Uh, it's time to Ellie's birthday. She has said prizes are wonderful, but, you know, know that they're not essential to, to be, if you get them, that's great, but it shouldn't be your, your reason for wanting to be in this business, because I think they make monsters out of people. Uh, you mentioned back a few minutes ago, and <laughs> Margaret O'Brien once said to me, does the Mac Award, that, oh, that must be your award. I said, oh, no, trust me, Margaret. That's, in my house, the Mac Award is known as Passover. Uh, so, <laughs> has nothing to do with me. Um, it's, you know, the, the, nice, the nice part at the end of the night is, is, is it's when people come up to you, I think, and, and talk to you and... and, and say you made us happy i mean that's the greatest reward that that any performer can get and she I think, made I think she loved she would sign anything she loved fans but also her peers i mean there was a uh, we were at joe allen's eating at one point and um linda lavin came up you know and knelt before her and just wanted to say hello again and christine ever saw and you anybody that was there she was the center of the room because the industry people knew her. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what she wanted, again, for that younger generation, that, that uh, she wanted them to make it because she liked nothing better than talent. Talent thrilled her. And, and she loved to push talent. Yeah. Something that she had in common with Judy Good because Judy was the same way. I mean, Judy, when, when she saw Barbara and said... We gotta have her on my show. She's gotta. We everybody. I mean, Barbara was already making strides, but that duet between Judy and Barbara is is legend. I wish Kay and Judy. I wish Kay had been on the. I mean, the Judy Garland show didn't last long, unfortunately. But God, I would have loved to have seen her and 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 Judy duet together. Right. Oh, can you imagine those two voices? Yeah. 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 yeah and I, I think that's. That's what we were talking about with community as well. There's always competition. We get into this and there's competition. Yeah. Day one. But there's also this community that in tragedy and respect of, of another person's craft that you do push other people up, especially when you get to a certain place. What she did with Fred Ebb and John Kander and uh, anybody else that, uh, oh, several songwriters, the people that wrote um, Hey Ma for her, she would she would uh, push their name forward always, and and you know as as much as it was maddening, if somebody would call her and we'd be working on the book or something, and I think I told you this, I said you know Doris Day calls and she says come talk to Doris. I said no, I'm not going to talk to Doris. Um, but she wanted that connection. She wanted oh, you know, say hello to you. Do you know this person? And um, I think that's why when she was in New York, especially, I heard stories about these wonderful soirees on Sunday that you would go to eat at Kay's and Eli Wallach would be there and Janice Mars would stop by and Marlon and uh, uh, Gypsy Rose Lee and Maureen Stapleton, all of them, all of the people in the village, it was a gathering place. And she loved that. I can just see her sitting back and, and laughing and letting these people talk. And the documentary is, so, I'm so glad that it happened because there, there, there are many people that have been overlooked and, and it's, it's such an important, I mean, in terms of introducing her to new generations, uh, especially theater, because I think aspiring Broadway performers, to, well, you mentioned Broadway is the golden age and it's so sad about Rick because... What a brilliant documentary, and it's so wonderful that Kay was it was a part of that. Was she going to be a part of the next film as well? I think she had some interviews in the second one. I'm not sure. I yeah. know that it started in the with the '70s, so I think there was some pirates of Penzance things that were going to be in there. And yeah. um, I think Rick was with us when she donated her hat from Pirates to the Smithsonian, um, and uh, I, I, I believe he interviewed her then for that section of Broadway because, you know, the first one was 
about Glass Menagerie and, and all of these people who were your influences and the actress studio when that came in. And the second was, was going to sort of be, you know, chorus line on. And then there was a third one, I think, in the works. What do you think her legacy will be? I know that's a very cliche question, but. Well, I, I number one hope that people will look for it because a legacy is only there for the, the people that understand it. You know, yeah. so what you're saying about go look at this documentary and, and thank goodness it is there because there have been a whole lot of people that have uh, either deserved a documentary or, or made one that never went anywhere or, you know, uh, it's not it's very lucky to have that record i think yeah. her legacy is the things we've been talking about in that she was true show business and true performer um she she just wanted to work in this community and to entertain people and she says right in the beginning of the book with her mother and and, and taking the hat and singing every little breeze you know um and saying mom i don't want to cook dinner i want to you know what she say she said mom i want to sing i want to dance i want to make people laugh she says cook dinner they'll laugh <laughs> so, so she, her her legacy maybe also is in a in a strange way something that we have focused on today in diversity and um uh inclusion and confidence in yourself that here's this girl that is sort of this uh, anomaly, ugly duckling, or or not ugly duckling, but not. Where did this girl come from in this Italian family? And somehow in her soul, she knew what she had to do. So she goes out. She she goes to California because somebody says Mike Jones is gonna use you. So she flies and doesn't know anybody and stays at the hotel waiting for a phone call. And. <laughs> Actually, she does get in Spike Jones Orchestra and tours the country with him. And it was just a perseverance and a, a knowing that I belong here somehow and I'm going to do anything to be part of this. That has not changed. It's just gotten dip more difficult because there are so many more people and so much more competition, so much uh, in some ways. And I, I, I do think this is true, higher level talent because people have started early and they have more venues to be able to put it out there. Yeah. Um, so I think her legacy of just keep, keep at what your soul tells you you're supposed to do and you'll do it. What's, um, you have a fondest memory of her? Was there any one particular moment or something that you, a moment that the two of you shared anything that that stood out uh, well uh no then when you say that then a montage hits my mind okay her her laugh was like no other when she truly laughed i mean you knew when Kay thought something was funny she could be a polite and laugh but when she truly thought something was funny there was nothing like that laugh yeah uh and uh the the moment i met her he wasn't, the, you know, on the tour was uh, Mimi Hines and Lee Merriweather and Darlene Love and um, uh, Georgia Engel. And I think Lee Merriweather was the one I was most nervous of meeting because that was the person I, I'd seen mothers-in-law. But I, I didn't, like you were saying, didn't quite have a handle on who this Kay Ballard was. Well, I got to the rehearsal hall first and it was winter and she had a little knit cap with little uh, things over her ear. And she was waiting for rehearsal to start. And I think one of the first things she said to me is, um, uh, do you have a blow dryer? I can't get my head, uh, my neck ne neck wet or I'll, or I'll catch cold. She didn't even know who I was. She just said it, right? And from that moment, I knew, okay, I, did, I didn't know she was from Cleveland at that point. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There was this sort of, I know this woman, nothing she, you know, she terrified people. But she was loud and she was demanding sometimes. But she was she was just sort of uh, she she and I'm sure she said this to many people, but we felt like at a certain point we were soulmates, you know, because we could say anything to each other. So I think that's what I sort of missed the most is her calling and, and saying, hey, this is the new thing we're going to do. Hey, hey, did you see this? Hey, you have to you have to you have to watch this TV show. You have to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Were you, were you, because they did have a memorial because I, I, I remember reading that she said she didn't want anything and she, you know, she didn't want any, 
any of the tip, which I thought, wow, you know, Italian, because, you know, usually it's, it, it's a four-day process, no, <laughs> the I saying think, to buy stuff. I, I wasn't there, but uh, uh, friends of hers put it together for, and I think it was good for the people that were able to say goodbye. I think that was yeah. good. Yeah. Um, Kay wouldn't have shown up, but yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so I think that was good. And, and uh, uh, I hope people do go to her website because we are still finding things that we, we put on the website that will go to um, causes she loved, like guide dogs of the desert. And her, her last four puppies, she had about a thousand in her lifetime. They just kept, re you know, a new puppy would show up all the time. Uh, her puppies are doing fine uh, two years after her passing and they're being taken care of. And uh, so uh, I think you'll find a lot of neat things on the website too about her career. Um, we're keeping it up so that people can go there as well and see when she did what and pictures that didn't fit in the book and things like that. It, it, it's a great archive. Yeah, it, it's, and it's kballard.com. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, put, make sure to put it up on the screen. Um, and then YouTube, because I know a lot of the, the clips have been provided by, by kballard.com. So for anyone watching, you have to go and check it out, guys, because there's just, again, I, I know a lot of people like my mom and my godmother, uh, you know, they remember the mothers-in-law, but there's so much more there in terms so of take you you know if you've ever gotten lost in the rabbit hole of youtube you yes start here and five hours later you end up somewhere and uh her life is that way you'll go in and find jimmy durani and go oh he was on the mothers-in-law oh that was a neat episode and then oh they did this sketch of let's make a deal where they dressed up as uh rabbits because you love uh because you love, oh, Greg Hyatt. Hi, Greg Hyatt. Um, because you love Jimmy Durante. Well, she is connected to so many people in 20th century showbiz that you will go down the rabbit hole just from looking at her career. Yeah. From Shelley Winters to Ethel Merman to Gower Champion to it, it, it's endless. Yeah. And the documentary, the show goes on. That's available on Amazon. I know it's available on YouTube. Uh, yeah, to, this is available to for uh, old-fashioned people who like DVDs, like myself, and also, uh, it also the um, streaming. So, yeah, Lonnie Gertz, my life is flashing before my eyes. <laughs> and we have, um, and again, it, and and check out the book. Check out the book, How I Lost Ten Pounds in Fifty Three Years. You're going to want to listen to the audio again, as Jim pointed out, because it's not just the book, but she adds. And you guys need to work on getting this on Audible. If there's any way to have it for people to be able to download and listen to, it, it would be wonderful. Um, I hope there's another, again, see, I'm a big geek this way. I, I've, I've fallen in love with, uh, Kay would probably appreciate this, Mother Dolores Hart, the nun who kissed Elvis. <laughs> and, uh, and her book is wonderful, but it's not available on Audible just yet so uh look into that because and you you young people um who don't remember cds oh well, well, I, well no i think I, I i i believe that um someone is looking into that and i hope they do because you're right it needs to be available for everybody no matter how they can find it yes yes i'm i am i am an old fart i actually have a cd walkman that i you know listen to Kay and judy and all of them on. In fact, I went into the gym just before the pandemic and I went to sign in and the little queen behind the desk said, wow, I didn't know they still made those anymore. <laughs> Should I hold up K78s over here that I have? Oh, uh, yeah, those two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, vinyl has made a comeback, so. <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate it. I mean, K would have loved... Kay would have loved, uh, I, I don't think ego-wise, um, I don't think she cared that people were out there talking about her, but that she, the same thing, and I guess this, maybe this is the legacy, the same thing, the reason she wrote the book was not for her, it was so that people would remember all the people she worked with, that yeah. they wouldn't forget. And if we're doing that same thing for her, there couldn't be anything better. Exactly, exactly so. So, Miss Ballard... Wherever you are, we love you. Thank you for the years of entertainment. And you're going to, you know, as Liza Minnelli once said, thank God for film. Because because of that, you know, Kay will always be with us. And uh, 
Thank you so much for what you do, Jim, and and for helping us write that. Thank you for thank you for finding me. Thank you for having me, and and um, your show is great. And I, I I think this forms its community as well, and all the people that are writing in. They, we could talk for hours about the stories of how we're all related, and it's not six degrees of separation; it's about one and a half. So, um, and I think if you're in theater long enough, or in in this industry long enough, you realize that, and it's wonderful. Come, please come back sometime. I would love for you to come back. Please come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight as we uh, salute the great Kay Ballard. And again, visit kayballard.com. There's plenty of YouTube clips. Also, shameless plug, we're getting ready to start our virtual uh, theatrical shows until this COVID nightmare is over. This weekend, I think Kay would have gotten a kick out of this. My show, Judy Garland and Company, will be back on uh, this Saturday, which is February 27th. And uh, it's not only Judy, but it's Dame Medna and Catherine Hepburn will be joining Judy this particular week. And then we have our the original Golden Girls Live, which starts up the following week. So uh, check those out on Peter Mack is Judy Garland on Facebook, as well as the original Golden Girls Live on Facebook. And uh, also, Mac and Chat, please like the page, subscribe to the YouTube page. We've had wonderful interviews with other performers and writers, so I hope you'll check that out. Uh, you can just subscribe to Mac and Chat on YouTube or like Mac and Chat on, uh, on Facebook. That would be great if you could do that. So thank you guys so much. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.